The stream's about to go live. Where are you two going? Hello everyone, welcome back to Totally Tanked. This is episode 38. We're going to do the Vickers Light Tanks of the Interwar Period. My name is John, I'm joined by Rob. Hello everybody, I'm Rob. Very importantly for posterity, it is the 8th of October 2022, so everything we say is completely true and accurate at this time, but could become totally wrong later. For those who don't know us, we are Totally Tanked. Oh yes, we are a tank podcast called Totally Tanked. That's us. What have we got this week, uh, this month, John? The Vickers Interwar Light Tanks. Now, it's not just one, uh, it's not just two, it's, it's many. actually many, but and we're focusing... For those on the video feed, they're shining behind us. But they're most, uh, mostly we're going to be focusing on the uh, Vickers Mark VI and the six ton, uh, the Vickers six ton. Two separate uh, tanks made in two separate times, um, similar concepts, ideas, and uh, one had one had a... And very interesting influence upon the world of tanks as we had it as we knew it you know, between the 20s and 30s and uh, up to the 40s. So we'll get into them. Should we do a little bit of housekeeping first? Yes, housekeeping. Yes. Um, so this is the moment where we um, thank the patrons. We have patrons. It's lovely to we have do, you We folks. do have patrons. And they, they're the ones who got to, uh, one of our first patrons got to select uh, what tank we're doing this this month and they chose the British Interwar uh, Light Tanks. Which tank we want to start off with? Let's do the Vickers 6 Ton. The Vickers 6 Ton. Now this was a very interesting, um, it, who, who didn't, who built it and who didn't use it, John? British built it, sold it everywhere, didn't use it. And um, I think at this point, I want to... No, we won't talk about that yet. Sorry. So, Sorry. designed by uh, John Carden and Vivian Lloyd in 1928. Mm -hmm. um, and by, for the Vickers Company, they produced four for the British Army. And the British Army said, yeah, we're a bit tight on cash right now. So, we're uh, not going to go for that. And this is 1928, remember. So, this is only... that They started into uh, the interwar period and they're saying and they're going the league of nations is going through the period of saying well we're going to outlaw war that the end uh, the first world war was the uh, the war to end all wars there will be no more war after this and we only need uh, light tanks in order to carry out um policing activities especially in those damn colonies mm. um Okay, all right, you brought it up, so let's talk about it. The, um, <laughs> the international disarmament movement is largely forgotten and disgraced now because a certain Hitler, A, um, showed that they were wrong um, and foolish, and it sort of morphed into the nuclear disarmament movement um, and has been in that part of left-wing politics um, forever. But in the interwar period, you know, everyone got out of World War One saying that was horrible. They were, you know, literally carving into stone the war to end all wars. And people are saying, how do we make sure it actually is the war to end all wars? In the actual text of the Treaty of Versailles, which formally ended World War One, there was a commitment that they were disarming Germany first, but it was very clear that the plan was from there to move to global disarmament so that a war like World War One couldn't happen again. And obviously... Um, there were a lot of machinations and people in government weren't entirely signed on to um, making themselves completely vulnerable to future threats um, with some good reasons. Uh, but it's a, it's a real lost moment in history because if it had succeeded, then, you know, World War Two wouldn't have happened and, um, you know, tens of millions of lives wouldn't have been lost as well as, you know, the disruption and disaster and, and pain and suffering and grief and loss and, and all those things that still haunt our present day com coming out of that conflict and, and, and later conflicts. So it's a shame the disarmament movement failed. It's not necessarily its fault. Um, it's also worth noting, though, that government decisions, um, if you read... Particularly, there's a book called British Naval Procurement 1921 to 1938, which sounds very dry, but gives a real sense of, particularly with the Vickers Company, a lot of stuff that was going on using the cabinet records. And also Corelli Barnett's book, The Collapse of British Power, I would highly recommend for dealing with um, interwar um, imperial policy. Oh, I read and that one back in 1994. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, and and defence policy. Um and again, very much relying on, on the cabinet papers. So every time someone was coming to the British government, in particularly the 20s um, and the early 30s, saying, hey, we want to spend lots of money on more battleships or aircraft carriers or, um, or, or more tanks, 
they were having to explain why money should be spent on this. Now, the early 20s, they were willing to spend the money on these things and actually do some of the research and build the, uh, some tank doctrine and uh, development plans. Mm. But by 28, 29, there's... Uh, there was a little thing called the Great Depression around well. That as well. No, it was actually the 28, so they, they were all for it. And by 29, they said, yeah, no, nah, we're going to uh, skip that one and uh, we're going to cut everything back. So that, that was was the Great Depression. I, I can't remember if the Great Depression happened by the time they made those decisions, but there was uh, there was a turning point uh, in in those those years. It was, but but any major defence procurement was coming up against opposition um, in cabinet in Parliament from the politicians saying, "Hang on, why are we spending money on weapons when we're supposed to be moving towards not having weapons at all?" Uh, and it reminds me quite a lot of the way at the moment we've got all these treaties about dealing with climate change, but whenever someone says, okay, well, if we're going to be climate neutral by 2050, we're going to have to um, get rid of all the petrol cars today or at least start getting rid of them, and everyone goes, whoa, 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 what are you talking about, crazy? Um, so the same sort of dissonance between um, what people want to achieve and the things they commit to in treaties is happening with the things you actually have to do to get to the place you think you're going to. Uh, and frankly, the, the same sorts of people are involved on both sides of it, which is a little distressing because, you know, failure on climate change is not going to be good for anyone. Um, but bring us back to the Vickers six time. Yes, I was going to bring us to Vickers immediately on this point. If really? You give me a second. All right. Yeah. Okay, the big thing with Vickers was the Vickers had some capabilities, and Vickers was a huge industrial conglomerate. Uh, and uh, it lives on sort of as a bit of Rolls Royce and a bit of BAE. Um, but uh, at the time it was this huge industrial conglomerate and pretty much had the only steelworks in the British Empire that could make um, armour plate for heavy vehicles. And I'm talking battleships and um, the British armoured aircraft carriers. But they didn't have any need for that capability in the 20s and it was this question of how do we keep Vickers alive and as a going concern and retaining their capabilities without actually spending lots of money. And they had to make a lot of really hard decisions um, as to how to... And because Vickers was a private company, it's, you know, the shareholders were um, reaping the returns of any government assistance mm. it was getting. Um, and and you know, at a time when you know, people were going hungry, um, that's a hard thing to justify. But if they hadn't kept Vickers going, then you could make a very good argument that World War II would have ended in British surrender in 1940. So... Um, the the folks who circumvented all the treaties to try and um, keep Vickers in business were vindicated by history, but they really could have been villains if things had gone a different way. Yeah. But the Vickers Corporation has designed a tank in the 1920s. The British government doesn't want it for various reasons. Um, but the rest of the world is saying, um, we think we might want to get into this tank thing. Yep. Uh, so, they, so, they only made 150 of these tanks, but... They are all sold to overseas countries, except for four that uh, the British Army had evaluated, looked at, said, yeah, no. Nah. Um, so production started in 28 and went through till 1933. Um, uh, they, as I said, they only made 158. The s- came in two varieties. Now, hopefully you will have... Uh, there we go. There's the uh, photos, the two varieties of... Those are the T26 models, but they are based upon... Um, so we'll get into the, so we're not actually going to cover the T-26, which the Soviets made based upon the Vickers 6 We'll cover it briefly and tangentially, yeah. but it's going to be an episode of its own, because yeah, there are thousands because, of them. Yeah, there were 12,000 of these made, of those, the T-26 made by uh, the Russians prior, or the Soviets um, prior to World War II. Um, but the Vickers 6 the actual original version, uh, it had... Two variations, uh, the A and B. Uh, one had the twin cupola, sorry, twin turrets with machine guns. The other had the. Uh, with and I've got to say, they are the stupidest looking things. They really are. Oh. But as you can see from the photos, they you, you would think, why would anybody come up with the idea of uh, this this sort of uh, turret configuration? And then you had the um, the version with the three pounder, uh, three pounder gun in it, which was the. Uh, and and a Vickers machine gun. Um, it had 19 to 25 mils of armour scattered around it, uh, 25 on the, uh, the front of the turret. Um, crew was three in the gun version with the single turret or four in the uh, machine gun version with the twin turrets. You could do 35 k's an hour um, cross country and on road. Which was pretty fast. Yeah, it was, it was decent. It was decent. Uh, it could do 160 k's and... 7.3 tonnes worth of, uh, of tank in there. Um, it was a little uh, tank, but 
he got sold to. <laughs> he got sold to, and it went, and not just sold, but also then captured and uh, used by various countries over the time. So, the Soviets bought fifteen in nineteen thirty. One, I want to say. Um, so this is long before. So they finished their revolution. Uh, Stalin had taken power by this stage, and they were after some sort of tank. And uh, one of the situations with the various League of Nations treaties is that you weren't allowed to build heavier tanks, and so you were allowed to have light tanks because that could be used for police actions. Uh, against any upstart colonials that might. Well, be I mean, you even look in um, a lot of police forces around the world mm. today operate um, smally armoured vehicles, mm. um, you know, for dealing with people they displease of. Yeah. <laughs> so the Soviets bought fifteen and plus a license to build their own, and that's where they then turned it into the T twenty six. As we said, made, they made twelve thousand, so that's a significant number. Uh, Poland bought bought fifty. Of those, they. Put together and, and they constructed 38 of those to put them together uh, and then they used the other 12 for spare parts. Portugal bought two for evaluation purposes. Greece bought four for evaluation purposes. Bulgaria bought eight. Bolivia bought three. And now we'll get into what uh, what happened with the, those Bolivian threes, uh, three tanks at some stage. China, and I, when I say China, I'm talking the nationalist Chinese, bought uh, 20. Uh, Siam, which saw quite a lot of action against the Japanese. Yep. Um, they weren't messing around with those. Yep. Siam, or Thailand as we call it these days, bought 30. Canada had 12. Finland had 26, uh, and they bought an, and they had another eight delivered. Um, the Finns had all theirs, none with their, none with their weapons installed. They said, you know what, we'll take the tanks, we'll leave the guns out. Because we think they're rubbish, and we'll put our own guns in there. Thanks. Yeah, the thirty-seven millimeter Bofors anti-tank gun was a much better weapon than. (laughs) Certainly was. Yeah. Uh, Japan bought one for evaluation, and boy, did that turn up in the hargo. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And that was in nineteen thirty. They they bought theirs. uh, They got theirs for evaluation, and uh, they really said, "Okay, this is the design we're looking at." And from that, they then designed the hargo. Turkey had this is having sixteen, but I'm not sure if they were, if they were bought or in. So they got sixteen in 1940. Now I'm not sure if those were purchased at some stage or they were gifted as captured um, uh, six tonners or somebody's misidentified the six tonners as um, T20 T26s and they were given those from captured stocks from the uh, from the Germans. Um, the UK, had, as I said before, had four for training and evaluation purposes. Romania. List is having 19. Again, I think those were captured from the Soviets and they were probably T-26s rather than uh, the proper Vickers 6 tons. Um, but significantly, uh, unlike the uh, Mark VI, uh, there is no depiction of the Vickers 6 ton in Girls und Panzer, uh, unlike the uh, T-26, of which there is. Okay, well, that's that's the most important fact uh, we can uh, impart. Yeah, I'll just throw in the Spanish uh, Republicans had one that was captured by given to them sold to them by Paraguay who they who Bolivia had, I believe no by Paraguay oh, okay yeah who had captured it off the Bolivians when we'll get to the mm. uh, the Grand Chaco War yeah and although the Spanish Republic did also get a number of um, T26s, T26s from, from the, the Soviets, Soviets. Yes. and it is worth noting with the Soviets and You'd love to be a fly on the wall when they negotiated this. Soviets did buy a license from um, Vickers to mm. produce the T-26 uh, based on the um, the six ton. And um, that was quite something when you think about it, that at this point, you know, communism was the um, the big bad, the enemy. Um, everyone thought that was going to be the next thing that we were fighting. Fascism wasn't, at that stage, viewed as the... Um, no, the, the fascists the, the, the trains were on time. Everybody was for them. Well, but they t- brought order and res- stability to Europe. Yeah, I mean... It, it, in terms Little of, did they know. The end of the disarmament movement was pretty much when um, Hitler withdrew Germany from the um, disarmament conference. That was 1934. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so this is before all that. So, yeah, yeah this is significant. there are significant times um, within the production of the Six Tunnel. I was saying, yep, it happened before a lot of things went, uh, uh, everybody started seeing the writing on the wall. It wasn't a useful combat vehicle in, in many ways. And look, the, the, the twin turrets, it's just, you just look at those and you just go, 
and I, I had a good look at them. Uh, so the um, 226s they have at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum that uh, I've t- taken the photos of and uh, we got up there behind us. Um, I had a good look at them and then the distance between those two turrets is not a lot and they can only fire 120 degrees to left and right from uh, their, their forward. So you can't bring both guns to bear on the same target unless it's right in front of you. There was that cult of the machine gun era when people viewed the main purpose of a tank being to act as a mobile mm. um, pillbox for um, spraying machine gun fire. And as we've discussed in other episodes, it came along in people's minds somewhat later that actually firing a high explosive shell was um, a better way of... Um, Being anti-personnel. Yeah. Uh, one thing, that, one of the reasons why they did do it, though, is they found that twin turrets, you actually get a higher rate of fire than if you had two, uh, two machine guns within the same turret. Uh, and you could actually engage uh, targets more... For a machine gun, you could actually engage targets more effectively because you had a wider range of fire. So whereas a lot of tankets that were being deployed at that stage had, um, with the, as machine gun carriers, could only fire forwards, and so didn't even, weren't even mounted in a, um, uh, any sort of mount that could allow them to slew left and right unless without moving the actual tank yet themselves. So this is the uh, Italian CV-33 or 30 or whatever they are, now, and uh, other sort of, uh, and the Carden Lloyd carriers. A very exciting thing that came out of the six-ton, though, was technically it's called the turret platform, and when we discussed the Italian tank, um, I described it as the wedding cake design. Uh, where rising above the um, the tracks, you've got this um, little square platform that the turret then gets plonked on. And once you see it here in the Vickers 6 ton, and you, um, those watching on the video will see it happening behind us, uh, you then look at the Italian tank, um, you definitely look at the T26s, but there's a whole generation of tanks that retained this feature to create a little more um, volume inside the tank uh, and to give the turret a bit more elevation before tank designers realised down the road that this was just a really stupid, terrible idea um, and what you did not want to increase the height of the vehicle unnecessarily. No, not unless you had a specific reason for uh, mm. raising that. But it does... Let's lean into the idea of uh, the design of the tank. Now, remember, the main tanks that we'd seen during World War uh, One was the um, was Mephisto, the... Uh, you know, A7V? Yep, AF, uh, AF7V. Yeah. And um, the Mark IV and V uh, British tanks. Great big lumbering things. Now, the Renault uh, FT had mm. come out... Do you know what the F in FT stands for? Tell me. French. Good on them. French tank. Yeah. <laughs> Renault French tank. <laughs> when, the, when the Americans bought um, a great number of them and equipped their troops for use in... Um, Late 17 to 18, um, they distinguished it as, um, yeah, Renault FT for French tank. There you go. Mm. Because there were so many other tanks too. Oh, this is unlike the Americans who could just name everything M. Or uh, gun motor carriage. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's an M in that. Uh, but anyway, so the the only other tank there out in, in significant numbers at this time was the uh, Renault FT. And so, which has a similar design of it's got uh, external tracks, it's got a driver and a forward and a. Um, uh, t- well, I think it had the. I can't remember if it has a two or... No, we haven't done the Renault FT yet. So no. I can't remember if it has a one or two person turret. But anyway, I it has a turret just, with a gun. it's just a one person turret. It has a gun, yeah. turret with a gun. And that being the idea of that is what becomes the modern tank. Now, the Vickers 6 ton uh, reinforces that idea of saying, this is what a tank looks like. And in 1928, people still weren't sure what a tank was going to look like in the future. And that's well, they weren't sure what they were going to use them for either. Mm. And I mean, frankly, um, we still haven't resolved that debate. Um, yeah, and... And there was this interesting thing, of course, where the um, the cavalry did not want these smelly vehicles. They wanted their horses. Mm. Um, and eventually they would come kicking and screaming when they realised it was either accept vehicles or um, be um, you know ushered off the battlefield completely. So suddenly cavalry use of tanks comes back as a scouting and screening um, vehicle. Um, and they get rolled into the, uh, uh, in with the Royal Arch, uh, Armoured Corps. Yeah, uh, but then there's, you know, is it a Royal battle... Tank regiment, actually, Royal Tank Regiment. Right. But, you know, is it a battlefield assault gun um, or um, is it an infantry support vehicle? Is um, it manned by artillery? Is it manned by yeah. uh, cavalry? Is it uh, dedicated uh, tankers? Mm. Or, you know, or is it organic to the um, infantry division, which is not a bad place to have it for a number of uses? But, uh, as, long as, you're, uh, as long as you're not curtailing its use as to what a tank should be doing rather than just supporting infantry. You don't want it... If, you're, if you've got a tank, you don't want it just supporting infantry. You want infantry supporting it. 
Yeah. So it's carrying out it, it, its activities. But we are we are talking about an era where engines did not have enough power for all the things they wanted the tank to do, mm-hmm. and it it wouldn't really be until 1943 that you know with uh, Meteor that suddenly there was hmm. um, even at the beginning of the war yeah. the the Brits uh, still didn't have an engine that they could actually use effectively. That's why they yeah. were bringing in the American Liberty engines to yeah. uh, to install in their tanks, but. Um, yeah, you're right. It was the the meteors that's coming along later. But anyway, so as I was saying, so it the Vickers six ton becomes the model for those early interwar year tanks, along with the Renault FT. The, uh, it had better maneuverability, speed, and armor than the uh, Renault, and um, it was still a low cost, and so that's why people were willing to buy it from Vickers, even though the British um, uh, Army were not. Um, and so it from there. It got used around the world, uh, as mainly, as we're saying, the Soviets with their license to build the T-26s from that. But we'll get into uh, some of the um, some of the activities that it was used for in that, especially mm. in that interwar period. I think it's worth just noting that it was very much the template for pretty much every country that started using tanks. For well, we, we while we figure out these vehicles, we'll get some of these and um, trundle them around. Um, they were of no real use or value in the Second World War, but the experience they um, gave and the um, allowing for the creation of um, cores and training cadres and, and maintenance and, and all the things that peak countries had to figure out to use them, the uh, the Vickers 6 ton was incredibly... Um, and then maintaining the industry to actually be able to build tanks. Yeah. Well, you, you look at French tank design just immediately before World War Two when they're having to go with what they know are inferior designs because mm-hmm. French industry... French industry, one of the um, leading powers of the world, wasn't up to making things they needed. Yeah, well, same with the British. But we'll get to yeah. that with the uh, uh, the Mark Sixes. Mm. All right, so uh, the six ton conflicts. Should we go into what they're yeah, used okay. for? Yeah, okay. Right. Let's go with that. All right, so discounting actions whereby it was mainly the T26s, except for where the T26s were involved. Uh, the first main conflict, uh, to my knowledge, is was the Gran Chaco War between uh, Bolivia and Paraguay in from 1932 to 1935. Uh, now, it's always reported that uh, it was a big, well, it was a big fight for the potential of oil. Uh, so it was basically um, uh, the Gran Chaco was a great big deserty type uh, horrible area to that nobody lives in uh, between the two countries uh, uh, but there was speculation that there was oil in there and both countries were saying well we need something to um, um, bring up a, uh, get some money in the bank and thought look let's um, the the standard oil in the Bolivian American side and there was sh- Dutch shell uh, in the Paraguayan side still looking for oil in those areas, but hadn't actually found it by the start of the war, but they were both wanting to get in there. Um, it was the first use of tanks in the Americas uh, as a, in a combat situation in the Americas. So it was People say it was uh, in South America, but it was actually the first tank battle, uh, um, first use of tanks in all of the Americas. Mm. Well, um, I mean, North American tank battles have been thin on the ground and um, long, long may it stay that way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but the Hargo and the Sherman did fire that in that Aleutian Island. I can't remember the name. Okay. Of. Oh, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, covered it. <laughs> all right. So the as we said before, the uh, Bolivians had uh, with their German advisors had bought uh, three uh, Vickers six tons, and but they didn't go well in the dust and the heat of the grass uh, of the Chaco, um, and kept down and getting uh, either bogged, overheating, or breaking down. It's huh. a hard thing when you've only got three of anything, mm. uh, partly because they become the focus of the enemy attention and, and don't get a chance to shine, um, and just partly because, you know, one's always in the shop and um, the crew for the other one's on leave. They, and, had, they uh, had eight weeks of training by the time the start of the war started. Not so enough. No, no. So mm. they're having only just bought these things, uh, they've gone out there. And also, what are the German advisors helping them with? They're like, hey, we don't know what to do with these things either. <laughs> well, they, were the, they had maintainers as well there. So, sure. And they, yeah. were leading, they were basically leading the um, Bolivian army. At this stage. Sure, uh, yeah, but my, my, my point was more that the Germans were not the um, experts in armour at this time that they would become. But they were learning a lot themselves. Yeah, that was the bigger thing. Germany was getting more out of that than the um, Bolivians, I reckon. Yeah, and they um, and then they started buying some uh, Italian tankettes and other bits and pieces with flamethrowers and all sorts of fun things. Mm. However, um, getting back to the Vickers six tons, the Paraguayan. So they did uh, see a lot of action. 
Uh, they did break down a lot. Uh, the the water in the water cooled vicars kept on drying up, and lots of people died from dehydration and other horrible diseases because the uh, <clears throat> Bolivian soldiers were from high altitude and couldn't uh, didn't really like it down at uh, the hot, dry, con- uh, dry tropical conditions. Um, uh, on the ground, Chaco. Uh, however, the Paraguayans managed to capture two of these because six tons by uh, cavalry riding up on them, and uh, when they were isolated and away from their infantry, this will be a common theme with yeah. <laughs> tanks. <laughs> heard that before. <laughs> tanks, uh, tanks isolated without infantry support uh, are easily um, uh, uh, taken care of. So, so the uh, Paraguayans have captured two of them. As we said before, uh, they've then gone uh, sold one of them to the Spanish Republicans for the during the Spanish Civil War and the other one they kept as a trophy um, out in Asuncion and Asuncion, however you want to pronounce it, um, mm-hmm. I'm sure you're sure that is. Um, and they finally gave that trophy back to Bolivia in 1990, some 60, well, 55 years after. Um, so... Again, they had a significant effect on the war, either being the focus of the attacks or being able to break up the wooden pillboxes that were being used by both sides. And so um, eventually the Bolivians had to go out and buy a bunch of anti-tank rifles in order to take out their own tanks that had been taken by the Paraguayans. Um, so it's just one of those things. It's a source of considerable embarrassment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Although at least back in those days, an anti-tank rifle, you know, it's basically... A, what would today you'd think of as a fifty caliber hunting rifle? Um, well, yeah. yeah, these were yeah, fifteen mil uh, um, uh, anti tank rifles. Okay, a bit, bit bigger than a fifty cal, but, but not enormously bigger. And uh, you know, it's the the training, the logistics, just mm. even shipping them. You know, a box will do. Yeah. Uh, isn't the hardest thing in the world as opposed to um, trying to move um, javelins or in-laws mm. around today. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and look, the because it had. The, the tanks themselves had limited protection against small arms fire and even uh, or even sort of any sort of heavy machine gun fire um, and it was distinctly uh, morale um, depleting for the crew inside to be hit with hit hearing the tink 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 of small arms fire hitting the outside of your shell well, your they had tank sp- spoil it real spooling hazards yeah, as well even and, from and, small arms yeah, <laughs> and even uh, splash from uh, shrapnel from uh, um, sh- uh, shredded bullets h- mm. hitting the edges of the welds uh, on the tank or the where that uh, the, the plates would be meet together and um, uh, hot lead basically coming in through those areas. So yeah, well, I was, mean, spl- splash was also because these things had a lot of vision slits, um, which you know when you're designing your first tank ever in your life seems like well, maybe a way to go. Um, but lead when it hits hardened steel just deforms around it and turns liquid and sprays um, mm. in the inside. It may or may not kill you, but it makes you really feel really miserable. Yeah, it doesn't make it's not a good day. No, no. Yeah. So, um, but anyway, so that was the first little. Uh, it was a proper war. It was the last three years and depleted those two countries quite considerably. Uh, the next uh, situation was uh, Finland, and uh, there, thirty-eight of uh, thirty-eight um, Vickers, Mark, sorry, Vickers six tons. Um, they only had third. So when the Winter War of thirty-nine started and the Russians or the Soviets invaded, um, they only had thirteen of their thirty-eight tanks available. Uh, and then they, um, uh, as the Russians came, uh, the Soviets came in, and they sent their T twenty sixes through to the Finnish lines, and the uh, without infantry support or the infantry who had been lost and left behind. And of course, the T twenty sixes were breaking down during uh, through the, the the deep snow. Uh, once the um, they got isolated, the Finnish infantry were able to. Um, Take them, take them out, and then roll up the infantry that were following along behind with their machine guns. So the Russians had no uh, had had no fun, uh, as it were, of going into Finland with sending the tanks in first without infantry support. But when the Finns then tried it themselves with their Vickers uh, six tons, it had the same thing happened. They sent their tanks forward without infantry support. The Russians uh, rolled them up, and then uh, they basically had to sue for peace. So it was quite the slaughter by the sound of it. It was. So, it was. Yeah. They lost. Um, they lost quite, uh, all but six of their uh, six tonners. Mm. Yeah. So again, quite a significant war for those uh, those two countries in that time, prior and um, before them both entering. Uh, well, sorry, 
the Soviets entering World War II on uh, against the Axis. And the yeah, I mean, you look at Finnish history; they have a very different view of World War II. To yeah, it, was, yeah, it, it, it really was, and you can't really judge them for it because they were caught between nobody else was helping them. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it's what uh, you go with where the help is, because unless you're willing to give up your own country. If you if you if you're looking for something to read, um, the Mannerheim letter, which uh, Mannerheim was the um, president, prime minister of Finland, um, to to Hitler in 1944, where he says we're um, leaving the Axis. Sorry about that. Um, in a weird way, it's it's quite touching because he basically says, "Look, we know we've been allies, um, but um, when this all goes horribly wrong, uh, Germany will survive. But I'm not sure about Finland, so we need to um, look oh, after ourselves." Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah. Um, so that's why the, uh, one of the T26s you see, uh, in the slideshow behind us will have, uh, Finnish swash, uh, uh Gemini and crosses are on that one, but, um, no, they're actually Finnish markings. Okay. They are Finnish markings, but oh. it's a, their version of the, uh, swastika. Oh. Uh, so that's why. I thought that was a, it was a straight cross though. Anyway, that's no, fine. But it was, mm. uh, so, but they those ones are the T26s that the Finns had captured from the Russians and were then using against the, uh, against the Russians at that stage. Mm. Um, the next one was the, the Siam, uh, Franco war of October of uh, 1940. So once, uh, Vichy France had been established after the fall of France in June of 1940. Uh, Siam slash Thailand had said, right, uh, so these guys are pretty weak now and they, their government's just fallen. And so in uh, French Indochina, which is what we're looking at is um, um, Vietnam uh, combined and mm. uh, Laos and um, Cambodia and the Kingdom of Siam, which was an independent kingdom, the only independent non colonialized uh, air, uh, country in that part of um, Southeast Asia had their own military with uh, over 100 tanks, uh, 30 of which were uh, Vickers 6 tons. Mm. Said They don't talk much about how alive they were with Japan in the war, the ties. But, uh, anyway. No, well, uh, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> Japanese code prosperity for sphere. Yeah, look, I'm not saying the Getting... Thais had a lot of choices, but it is kind of when you read history of um, the Japanese invasion of Malaya, it's all um, oh, and then the Japanese suddenly invaded, and the fact that the Japanese have been able to invade through Thailand is something that really doesn't get talked about. Well, um, from anyway. the Thais' point of view, I'm the... not saying the Thais owed us anything. <laughs> no, um, yeah. I, would, I mean having the colonial powers uh, take uh, regions the, of their country for the mm. for the sake of it, because the same well. We can, which mm. is what the French had done for uh, uh, to Thailand, and which is Thailand. This is why Thailand has, has said in um, uh, October of nineteen forty, said, "You know what? You guys are weak. Um, we want the provinces that you've taken uh, some years ago back, and we're going to uh, take you on and, uh, and take them." And so eventually, they've uh, they've invaded, and they've had their uh, Vickers six tons running around and causing great havoc to the French colonial forces that were based in Indochina. Um, and they would have done, there was quite a large conflict there and the Vickers Six Tons would have done quite well at uh, having uh, one, one particular battle, battle, having defeated the French forces. They were chasing them down and were going to uh, basically route, route them. Uh, however, the French Foreign Legion troops that were stationed with those um, colonial troops uh, brought in their artillery and used it in direct fire support role and were able to stop the uh, advance of the Vickers Six Tons and stop the basically the route of the army of uh, that stage. Yeah, field guns really are the natural solution to light tanks. Yes, and, but uh, again, used, deployed, employed by highly trained uh, yeah. forces is essentially where, where it's coming to. And so yeah. the Japanese uh, stepped in to negotiate a ceasefire slash um, uh, armistice between the two sides and Thailand got um, back some of the uh, some of the territory that they had had to cede to the French previously uh, but not as much as they would have liked basically they would have liked to have kept on going but the Japanese basically had too big an influence in the situation and said no everybody's got to stop fighting and look we'll take over French Indochina right now as part of the uh, Axis Alliance with with Germany, and so that's why they were able to influence the situation so strongly in 1940. Mm. Um, then we've got uh, we've done the Finns, the Grand Chaco, the Vichy France, uh, Poland. Poland had their uh, Vickers six tons. They had um, again. They had 
38 of them, but they, sorry, they bought 50, but they only assembled 38 and used the other 12 for spare parts. Which is quite a sensible way to do it. Again, they they uh, had a number of innovations and upgrades to their tanks, uh, even so much so that they what, they went from 6 tonnes to 9 tonnes mm. uh, with bigger guns, uh, better armour, um, uh, better carburetors and better air intakes to stop overheating, better transmission. So they re-designated theirs as a... 30, I can't remember the number, sorry, 3017, no. Um, My big problem with the idea that, oh, we'll just get some extra vehicles as spares is that there's things like the actual hull of the tank that almost never wears out, um, but then there's things like um, final drives and transmissions that um, wear out all the time. So it's not necessarily the best way to buy spare parts to buy complete tanks. They, they still have some roles for training. Mm. You can do some things, but yeah. But if Vickers isn't isn't building any, doesn't have a production run of these tanks anymore, then and is saying to you, buy what you want now mm. because we are not going to provide uh, spares in the future. Then yeah. that's probably not a bad bad way of making sure that you've actually got. Yeah, I mean the, the Germans fell into the same trap where they did almost no spare parts production. They just shipped f- completed tanks to get cannibalized, and mm. um, you know that. I'd, just think that's a, a poor approach. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, the one thing with the uh, Polish uh, six tonners were, was that uh, they had been trained with and used for quite some time from their purchase in 1936 um, and were able to, in fact, no, sorry, from 33. And so they were quite worn uh, and their tracks were quite worn. However, when the Germans invaded oh, and Russians invaded in thirty nine, uh, they uh, did deploy them quite well. They were used effectively. However, they did not have the armor and capabilities to stand up to the uh, uh, the Panzer twos and the thirty eight Ts that the uh, Germans were running around in. I was going to say the twenty millimeter auto cannon is a pretty terrifying thing for one of these vehicles. Yes, that yes, it is. Doc, doc, doc. Yeah. So the Nazis captured a number of uh, uh, of their six tonners and converted them into self-propelled guns. And so, again, uh, they kept on going around the war. Um, the Italians, or will throw in uh, the Italian side of the house, mm-hmm. uh, they captured a number of T-26s during the Spanish Civil War. They had their... They weren't the Condor. They were the uh, Free Italian Company or something like that. Too. Mm. They were fighting on the nationalist side, on Franco's side. Um, they did capture a number of the uh, T-26s and brought them back to Italy, and they used those as the basis for design for their M11 uh, 39s and their M13 40s. So again, uh, to the point, they... as we discussed, you've got this turret platform that actually has no good purpose being there, but because the Italians were just copying the design yeah. over. So it wasn't uh, the six-tonner itself, but mm. they also didn't capture the uh, Bolivian six-tonner that the Spanish uh, Republicans had. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> so the six-tonner was designed and built in 28, along with the... Uh, uh, and along with the uh, FT, the Renault FT, was one of the em- preeminent tanks of that interwar-, interwar period. There were no other realistic tanks being built at that time from 28 until uh, even uh, later on. Later on. Um, well, it's the mid-30s you really get, get people getting started on yeah, uh, which tank design. Yeah, which is where we get into the uh, Vickers Mark VI. Yes. Um, however, it set the t- stage for tanks in the interwar years and when war was going to be outlawed and finished. Um, uh, I know we'll come back and mention a few other things, but is there anything else you want to say about the 600? I think that's good, and my beer glass is empty, so I we're, think we should do our first of two beer reviews. After we come back from this quick break. Oh. This ain't the Graga Rail. One pint down, you'll be swinging in the gale. Five pints, bully, you'll be shaking in your shoes. When I, when I started reading about the uh, Vickers 6 ton, I said, well, this is a tank that the... The British bought, but uh, we're not we're not using. Um, and I said, "Well, what's a beer that would go with that? And what's a beer that somebody produces but they don't actually drink?" And the first thought that came to my mind was Fosters. Fosters. For those who don't know, Australians don't drink Fosters. Yeah, but we, British people drink Fosters, and they pretend they're drinking Australian beer while they do it. Yes, um, they do not drink Fosters. So, uh, but John said. Yeah, we got it. So we came up with the idea of uh, a British India Pale Ale. Now, John, tell me why a British India Pale Ale is equivalent to uh, building a tank but not actually using yourself and exporting it overseas. So 
Now, it should be noted that modern IPAs have almost nothing in common with the historic um, India pale ales of the um, 19th century. But in the, the glory days of the Raj, a, um, a young British officer being sent out east um, was given a five-ton shipping allowance. And, to India, uh, that is. Yeah, to India and back from India. Mm. Um, now, the average young officer did not own five tons of possessions. Some definitely did because they were very wealthy, but quite a lot of them didn't. And they were looking around saying, well, what are we going to do with this? And then a bunch of brewers came up to them and said, well, me lad, you've got nothing in the world um, except your commission um, and your five ton shipping allowance. How about you let us put four tons of beer in your shipping allowance? And the water over there is very bad to drink. So you want some you can take, you can drink, well, you can drink. Yeah, yeah. Your, your, your young officer um, wasn't didn't get to drink any of the beer once they'd given up that space in the shipping allowance. <laughs> um, but so they were shipping beer over to India in the young officer's um, shipping allowance. Um, and then quite often um, the, they couldn't find sellers for it in the Indian market, um, so it ended up coming back. And what they discovered was that after a 18-month um, holiday to India and back in the hold of a ship, and in particular they put in um, more um, fermentables and extra hops to keep it from going off during this transit, and this was in wooden barrels, um, it was quite nice yeah. having been through this process of being a stronger hoppier beer um, that had had a um, long barrel aging process. So that's the the where you know, India Pale Ale um, IPA comes from. A lot of b really big beer um, nerds these days are saying we should call them Ippers like they do in Central Europe rather than IPA because the the modern ones have really no shared heritage with those historic beers. Um, but there we go. It's also it's a beer made for export is why we thought IPA was appropriate. Well, John thought it was appropriate. And so today we have a Fuller's uh, India Pale Ale. Yep. It is a One of the great London breweries. It is a 5.3% alcohol. It's a 500ml uh, uh, bottle, I'm assuming. Mm-hmm. That's uh, the... Uh, yep. Mm, and it's been bottle conditioned, they say. Mm. It just right. means they've left in the bottle for a while. Um, <laughs> possibly it means they've had some secondary fermentation in the bottle to make it fizzy. Um, yes, it's fine. It's very much a British IPA. Um... Very fragrant on the nose. Very snazzy looking bottle. Yeah. Uh, nine bucks for one of these. Yeah, okay. So 500 mil. So it's not too bad for a 500 no. mil. No, not, not bad at all. Um, and with that purple, you'll be... I was about to say. It matches your shirt. Ooh, very good point. Mm. It does match. There, there you go. It's, mm. uh, that's, uh, uh, there's a conversation to be you'll had You'll be there. a hit with the lesbians. <laughs> I already you am. You already are. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, they have uh, a, uh, not a rampant, but a some sort of hippogriff on the front drinking a beer, or is it holding hops? And lots of uh, curly cues. Of, yeah. Uh, oh, coming off. Anyway, it's, it's to be honest, I'm, I'm a little down on the IPA style at the moment because all these breweries all over the world are just making a beer that tastes the same as all the others, and um, I find that. Um, Sad. They could, they could all be doing wildly different things, but they don't want to because the market isn't there for wildly different things. Oh, um, no. Hmm. But it's beer. It is beer. It's pretty good. I like it. All right, Rob. Um, hang on. So, hang on. I want to yeah. talk about. Oh, you want to talk about your hat? My hat. Uh, uh, sorry. So, eleven-year-old me mm -hmm. went into the army disposal store somewhere in uh, Virginia. Back, way back when, and yeah, bought... Your dad was on a posting to the embassy, I believe. Uh, no, no, F-18's flight simulator. Oh, okay. Yeah, there we yeah go. with uh, some sort of... Okay, so but you, 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 you as a child were there in America because yeah. your dad was being posted yes, there with the yes. Air Force. Yeah. Well, no, no, he was a civilian at that stage. Mm. But uh, yes, so having bought this when I was 11, I've still kept hold of it, and uh, when I used to run around, not the... Uh, not the backwoods of Virginia, but uh, essentially the suburban woods of Virginia, uh, all dressed up in cams and having a great old time pretending to be uh, Red Dawn and so forth and having fun with that. But uh, So I found that in the cupboard the other day and I thought it'd go very well with the, the new split prism goggles that uh, we've got. Mm. So Only smells slightly of possum way. Only smells slightly of possum way. Mm. I did do a lot of uh, work to try and get the uh, the possum sm <laughs> wee smell out of it, but uh, it's still a little bit there. That's mm. okay. Yeah. I can put up with that because that's just the uh, smell of uh, mm. a lot of places and a lot of garages within a, within Canberra. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when, the <laughs> when the lockdown started um, here in this house, we had a possum infestation that became a lot more apparent when we were in the house 24-7 and uh, 
it had culminated the possum bursting through one of the walls and the, the dog's really? going absolutely berserk. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, um, all, it's all being fixed now. My, my, um, my dogs love chasing the possums uh, at mm. about 10 o'clock at night, and just, uh, mm. especially as they're coming Actually, out. Actually, it was, it was Roger the cat who was fiercest in repelling the invader. Uh, the, the, the dogs were following along behind. I, I, could, uh, I, could, I can tell you stories about my dogs and uh, worrying about uh, water bottle squirting uh, possums, but uh, oh. I, I won't for the moment. Cool. Because we're going on to another tank. The, the next British um, light tank tank of the interwar period, um, simply known as the Vickers Light Marks 1 through 6. Yes. Um, now, there, were, there was 1 through 5, but um, they weren't terribly interesting, and except for their design features. They, they, and, and there's marks, a couple of design marks, features. Marks is, let, me, let, me, let me do this. There's a couple of design features that are interesting. One is all of the Vickers Lights through 1 through 6 had parts commonality. So they very much were a continuum um, where they were making improvements and changing things, but the, the nuts and bolts um, and the, the fittings and the drill holes and the webbers and all that sort of stuff. Um, I don't even know if they had webbers. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> before someone goes nuts. Um, okay. Uh, anyway, the point was they, they were actually very similar vehicles, but Mr. Carden and Mr. Lloyd, our friends from um, the uh, Vickers 6 ton, yep. Designed the um, Carden Lloyd Carrier, which would evolve into the Universal Carrier, sometimes known as the Brand Gun Carrier. They also evolved the Carden Lloyd Carrier into the Vickers Light Tanks, to the point that in the early marks of the Vickers Light Tank, the return rollers were on the uh, mounted to the bogies, so it was on the same mounting as the bottom wheels. Um, and this was something that you needed in the carriers because the way they ste- the carriers steered was by pushing the bogey, the central bogey out and warping the whole track so the um, the, the tank would turn. steering a speed. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that was how they steered, and they carried that configuration over even though the Vickers light tanks didn't use the, um, the track warping to steer, but the uh, return rollers stayed on the, um, oh. on the bogeys. Uh, so there's, there's, the 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 Carden Lord carrier has some real continuity into the um, the Vickers Light, um, and that was only re- removed I think around the Mark III. It was it was removed as they progressed, um, and that and that's worth noting. Uh, but Carden Lloyd's design heritage through all these vehicles do carry through, um, which is part of why we've lumped them all together for mm. uh, for this episode. Um, but the there, there is significant commonality between Mark One through Six, even though they they look quite different, and at least they've gotten rid of the stupid wedding cake design yes. uh, by this point. <laughs> Rest of the Italians were picking it up, saying, "This is awesome. We can fit our stupid double machine guns in." But uh, oh, mm. all right, so we have the. Uh, I'm just going to be mainly talking about. Uh, I'll let you throw in anything about the one to three. No, five. I mean the six is the one that was built in serious numbers. Yeah. 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 So <clears throat> speaking of serious numbers, they built uh, sixteen hundred of them. Um, so. Not as many uh, as the the Russians would build the uh, T twenty six, but um, they are all built by the British, uh, and they had uh, oh, the, the production was from nineteen thirty six to nineteen forty uh, for the Mark sixes. The Mark one to five started from the nineteen thirty three. Uh, it was only only weighed five tons, or a bit over, as they started making a few changes. Um, it was four meters long, two meters wide, two point two meters high. Uh, it had for its armor mill uh, armaments, it had uh, the whopping anti uh, anti armor weapon of a fifty cal. Ah, but wait, it was not what we think of as a fifty cal today. No, because it, uh, it 50, 50 cal Browning was definitely in use by this period, and that's when when you think for fifty cal or twelve point seven millimeter, mm. um, we think of Browning, which is basically the you know with the car- the whole cartridge is the size of a banana and is is a impressive and terrifying round the vickers 50 cal was definitely half an inch wide um but was about two-thirds the um length of yes. the um browning um mud use uh, 50 cal so it was not as impressive a weapon even as the uh um, that was the yeah. that was their anti-tank round for this tank and they also yeah. had a 762 uh, machine gun with it so a Vic, basically a vickers uh, machine gun uh, also installed in there for, mm. um in a lot of ways, this was more about the Vickers company selling machine guns mm-hmm. and um, ammunition than it was actually about selling use- useful armoured vehicles. Well, it was a useful armoured vehicle mm. during, the interwar, <laughs> during the interwar period when mm. nobody else was... Uh, when nobody David else. DeFletcher described it as no military use whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> as a police vehicle, it was very effective for keeping the uh, colonials in check. Yeah, but an armoured um, truck would have 
sufficed for that. But yeah. yeah. Depends how uppity the, the, those damn colonials got. Mm. Um, okay, so later on, it did uh, get upgraded to a 15mm uh, cannon uh, from the from the 50 cal. Which uh, is it, not a. I mean, it's going from 12.7mm yep. to 15mm. It's it, not a huge upgrade. But it was a bigger round. It yeah. was a bigger round. It was. Um, uh, and for uh, it, uh, armor wise, it only had uh, it had between four and fourteen millimeters of armor, so even less armor than the uh, six tonner, uh, and basically very thin uh, and not as very limited protection, even against um, uh, it would only protect against small arms fire. Uh, anything decent sized uh, from a heavy machine gun would uh, you would be in trouble. Uh, however, both, uh, I forgot to mention before, that both the 6-ton and the Mark VI were designed to carry radios. So they would either be provided, uh, if the Mark VI's definitely all had radios, whereas uh, the 6 tonners only, they could carry, were designed for them, whether or not mm. they were installed, it was up to the countries of use. Which is really important to note, that at least these tank designers, and obviously Carden and Lloyd as a, as a pair knew a lot about what they were trying to do, but it's like, oh, of course you've got to have a radio. Mm. Um, whereas, the, you know, significant forces at the start of World War II were still saying, oh, maybe we can, you know, open wave the hatch flag. and wave some flags. And find, um, and find a, a, a driver, uh, sorry, a motorcycle rider to, uh, dispatch rider to uh, take our orders from one, yeah. one platoon to uh, After I've had time to sit down and write the orders out. Uh, and the other thing, they won't get lost and their motorbike won't yeah. uh, um, break down. The other thing with flag signalling is that, as, as has been frequently discussed, by the time you button up your tank for combat... Your chances of seeing that, that the um, lead tank has even raised signal flags. Well, it won't um, be the lead tank. It'll be the tank behind. It'll be the commander behind okay, you. The command tank. But yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, you're not going to see the commander behind you with his uh, <laughs> signal flags either, are you? You're <laughs> uh, one of those classic things. Like, how did they think that'd work? Uh, but um, but because, try they because did because they, they work on ships. You know what was really because well, they work because they work on ships. Signal That's... flags don't work that well on ships, and you've got lookouts everywhere yeah, and. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Point being is they work on ships, therefore it should work in, in, in the army. Yeah, um, it should be noted though um, that this was the dawn of the horseman suspension system. Yes, mm. the horseman coil spring spring suspension system, which would carry through until Chieftain in the nineteen uh, seventies. So um, people talk a lot about Christie, uh, and obviously torsion bars are, if you've got the interior volume for them, um, a really nifty way of. Um, doing suspension for a tank, but uh, this is where Horseman got started and uh, it would continue on for a very long time. Mm. Mm. Uh, crew of three, again, so mm -hmm. driver, commander and gunner. Uh, commander also loaded, worked as the loader and the I think the gunner had to work as the radio operator. Mm. Um, on they the... were still figuring it out right yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was yeah. still important to say, hey, you know what, we're going to put two people in the turret. Yeah. Um, one person is too busy up here. Yep. Um, good speed, uh, 56 k's an hour on road, 40 k's an hour off road, uh, 210 kilometer range. So it, it was something. Petrol could, engine though. Yeah. yeah but uh, the point being is it was it was fast, zippy, and could cover some distance. Mm. Um, that had a lot of capabilities uh, that a lot of tanks did not have uh, mm. at the beginning of the war. Um, as I said before, 1600 of them built. Uh, and yeah, however, once the uh, and it was deployed, let's see, the UK mm. got most of them. Let's face that one. Uh, the colonies uh, did get some, so Canada, Australia, India, the Indian uh, uh, British Army in India, or whatever they were calling themselves at this time, uh, did get a number of them. Uh, and they do get their own version in Girls and Panzer. So I just wanted to. What's well, the that, most important thing? That is the yeah. moment. Well, somebody's yeah. got it. Somebody's got it. So we've got the picture up right now of um, Australian uh, mugs who are uh, because light tanks um, in the, one of the Australian training areas. Oh. Um, did they did take them to war? I think with the sixth division. Um, well, yes. As one part of my reading is that mm. um, they were given to the Australians as part of their operations in Syria. So I'm, I'm assuming that'd be that, the sixth then. That were uh, they were carried out. They were part of the uh, uh, attacks that uh, had the Australians taking Damascus again. Mm. So for the second time. Mm. So again, one of those things that we'd like to harp on about because I keep saying that what's this tiny little country on the other side of the world doing taking one of the oldest cities 
in existence mm. twice. Yes, yeah, so for those who aren't aware, the Australian forces captured Damascus in both the second and first and second world wars, and it, looks, uh, and it looks like they might have done it in the Second World War. With you know, I couldn't find any documentation saying they did, but they were deployed with the um, the Mark Sixes in Syria, and they did carry out the attacks uh, to take Damascus. It is worth noting, if you have a thoughtful disposition, um, that. Frankly, once you take a cynical view of Australian military history, you notice that every single time we ever do anything, it's about oil. Um, and this is highlighted by the fact that our interventions in the Middle East in both world wars. But um, anywho, hopefully we can break we did, that habit. We did not mm. participate in the Anglo-Russian invasion of Iran. No, but we, it's because we were busy doing other yeah, things. I know, but, but and uh, that was directly related to oil. Yeah, well... <laughs> All right, which is where the Mark Sixes were operating. Mm-hmm. Um, so, where, where are my notes on that? Oh, no. Oh, no, that's all right. So they were mm-hmm. in somewhere. Um, so, yes, for those who don't know, um, uh, England and Russia can, uh, came together in order to... Uh, invade Iran in 1940 in order to uh, August of 1940 in order to secure um, railways from s- supply areas uh, no sorry it must have been 40 oh, hang on mm-hmm. you... well, I've got my notes somewhere in here that's alright we'll edit this out of the uh, podcast audio version so that's <laughs> something uh... <laughs> The um, video viewers get to enjoy watching Rob looking at his notes, which is always exciting. All right. um, Maybe let's move on. All right. Oh, man. But, 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 okay. Um, But, okay, so that was uh, one, okay. That was directly about a will, was um, the uh, uh, Anglo-Russian Soviet invasion of Iran to oust the Shah, basically secure the... Um, secure the oil fields of uh, of Iran and the railway from um, f- to in order to be able to supply Russia with lend lease equipment uh, f- through the Caucasus and su- and making sure that um, uh, the Russian oil fields in the Caucasus were protected from any subsequent um, invasion by Turkey slash uh, the, the the Nazis through that area. So. I was just basically shoring up their <clears throat> southern flank by invading a sovereign neutral country that had nothing to do with it and might have been leaning towards the Germans but had no had no alliances with them. Yeah, we just go back to the fundamental that for conflict in World War II, um, it was okay for cavalry use for rushing around, getting around flanks, screening, um, but there were... There weren't many better British vehicles, to be fair, but you, you could be sending troops out in universal carriers doing much the same thing for yeah. considerable less cost and difficulty. Now, and uh, carry more useful payloads, too. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, well, speaking of uh, the beginning of the war, um, the British had, of the 1,200, they, 1,600 they built, uh, at the beginning of the war, the they had 1,000 of these um, Mark Sixes available and in use within uh, the British Army. And only... Oh, excuse me. Uh, and only... Um, 160, 150 of the cruiser and infantry tanks, so your Matilda 1s and um, your A-10s, I want to say, mm. um, cruisers. Uh, and so basically they this was the majority tank. That the, I mean, compared to a Matilda 1, this is a better vehicle as well. Yes. Um, yeah. But and it, frankly, it, the cruiser 10, ugh. But, yeah. <laughs> but it was it was the majority tank. It was mm. They had 1,000 of these versus 150 mm. uh, of other things. They did leave quite a lot of them in uh, Dunkirk as well. But, uh, uh, well they were involved in the um, in def- defence of France in uh, 1940. Uh, mm. They were 400 on the continent. Um, however, you're right; only six made it out of uh, out of France. <laughs> and then you wonder why they bothered. Because <laughs> they could not compete against the uh, pa- again, as the Polish found, they could not compete against the uh, Panzer II and the uh, uh, T38s. Mm. Uh, 38T, sorry. Sorry, PZ38T. PZ38T. PZ, yeah. PZ, yeah. PZ the, the Czech tanks, which we will do the PZ38T. Um, and when we get out, we, are, we guys, we've got a model making challenge, um, planned, but I just need to move house before we start. Cause I don't want to 
be moving house with a half built um, tank model. Um, that seems like a recipe for um, yeah, yeah. horror. That's going to um, get squished in something. Rather. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that's coming up. We're probably going to launch that in the new year. Then the PZ38T is our candidate because it's such an important tank, and people don't realise that it was essentially the tank that smashed France after they'd nicked it from the Czechs. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yes. Anyway, and the the tank that it smashed was um, light tank Mark Sixes, which um, you know we're children. It's it's sort of you very much look at the, the all the the stupid British uh, light tanks of the interwar period, uh, not the interwar, the uh, Cold War period. Mm. Um, they look like well, this I, as well. Even even, even, <laughs> the, uh, even the early war period when they were just mm. trying to make up anything that they could in order to build up numbers yeah. and find one that worked. Yeah, but it, you know your you, you, you Saracens, your you know as we discovered up at the um, tank fest, sabers. the sabers. Um, uh, scimitars, um, Spartans, a uh, four-man APC, which is another yeah. stupid idea. Um, but you know they, they they all actually look very similar to to this, and so it's a concept the British have hung on to, um, despite its uh, at times dubious value. But for cavalry, it it does the cavalry role really well. Yeah. Mm. Um, all right. So from France, we then moved to North Africa. Uh, mm-hmm. where the British were facing off against the Italians, and it actually served pretty well uh, in the initial stages of uh, the North African campaign. Um, it was fast, it was mobile, it could cover great deals, a great deal of range, uh, and was able to outflank the Italian forces quite a number of times, especially after they'd... Uh, if they once the Italians broke from any attack or counter-attack uh, and were uh, retreating or uh, withdrawing, um, sending a bunch of Mark 6s around the flank at uh, 50 k's an hour, or, sorry, 40 k's an hour across uh, across the deserts of North Africa, they are able to then round up uh, yeah, against and, and scatter, scattered, scattered troops. And basically mm. that's why Australia had, what, 25,000 um, Italian prisoners mm. stationed here or basically... Uh, uh, consigned here during the war because we kept on, they kept on getting rounded up in North Africa. Yeah, we still got buildings in here in Canberra that were part of um, interning all the Italians, and uh, with all the um, the men folk of Australia off fighting the war, the um, Italian blokes on the farms um, put their feet under the table quite well. Yeah, uh... <laughs> there is a there is a, a nostalgic tradition of, uh, of, of within Australia of uh, looking fondly upon those times, and I'm assuming, I'm hoping the uh, the Italian prisoners of war that were stationed that were consigned here to Australia probably, uh, I hope that they uh, didn't mind their time here either. Uh, many of them stayed. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Right. <clears throat> particularly if the if the husband wasn't coming home from the war. <laughs> Yeah, um, okay. Um, All right, so while in North Africa there were 200 Mark 6s, but how, uh, by the stage they, they, the British had gotten up to 75 cruisers and 45 Matildas. Um, again, uh, they fared well against the Italian tankettes and light vehicles. However, when the M11 39s and the M13 40s started turning up, uh, the like no, uh, M Mark Sixes started having a lot more trouble, and and when the Panzer Threes turned up, they really had some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Not talking. <laughs> yes, yes. When the Africa Corps got got here, everyone said, "Oh, bugger, this is not going to be fun." Uh, and the the tank. Uh, um, the Royal Tank Regiments and the uh, the Desert Rats and so forth were very happy when they were supplied with the M three Stuarts and were able to consign. The Mark Sixes to uh, to history and say, yeah, we don't want to use that as a um, our scouting tank anymore. Thank you very much. Um, but they did still use them as mobile um, uh, observation posts and as anti uh, anti air uh, vehicles because they would mount uh, machine guns on external machine guns upon them. Yeah, we have got a picture in this in the slideshow of a um, the four the four mounted yeah, four barrel um, vehicle with yeah. Air defence theory, thankfully, isn't something we need to worry about too much in this podcast, but it gets quite interesting in terms of, you know, you, you can spray a bunch of small light arms, you're not actually going to shoot a plane down, but if you can force the plane to fly a bit higher, then it can't hit you with its bombs, mm. so that's that becomes worthwhile. Um, yeah, and, you know, and then when you get to the point where you have gun-laid radar with proximity fuses, you can just blat them all out of the sky. Mm. Um, um, they did. Uh, they were involved in the siege, of, the first siege of Tobruk, uh, mm-hmm. where they only had sixteen of them. But uh, by uh, because 
they were easily maintained and kept um, and kept mobile during uh, the siege. They were, the British were able to uh, move them around uh, the siege uh, around to Brook in order to create the illusion to the Germ- the besieging Germans that there were more tanks there than they thought they were. This is an interesting use case, and my first thought was, "Geez, that wouldn't be much help." But then it's like, "Hang on, if there's a breakthrough happening in your defences, and you can very quickly get a mobile pillbox with." Um, a- you know, um, two big machine guns um, into that, mm-hmm. that that can uh, plug your line long enough to um, secure things. It really can. And, uh, I mean, uh, the, the strategy always was was uh, to let the tanks roll, th- uh, the German tanks roll through the first lines of defence and then have the infantry to pop up out of their, uh, uh, where they've been hiding and, then ta- and engage the um, the infantry at Tobruk, uh, while the anti-tank guns and captured Italian uh, tanks and other bits and pieces would then take on the uh, Panzer threes that, that, that were trying to come there, and Panzer fours that were trying to come through. Um, mm. So, but yes, they did. Uh, they were deployed there. Um, the South Africans and the Canadians used them uh, more in Abyssinia and further south um, as part of the colonial uh, activities of so basically making um, ensuring the. The Italians didn't go, uh, didn't do anything more from around Ethiopia. Yeah, they, they were okay for beating up Italians. Yeah. Um, and you and know, they, I, 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 colonial Italian troops, yeah. not, not the. Uh, not the main, the Alpinis yeah. or anything like that. But, you know, I, I, I've often said in this podcast, it's a mistake to think of Italians as cowardly because of their World War II performance. It was more they just weren't actually all in with Mussolini and mm-hmm. um, were behaving quite sensibly based on the criteria in front of them. Um, <laughs> but, you know. Uh, their armoured forces weren't great because they didn't have the heavy industry to build what they needed. All right. Uh, If they'd kept something like the Vickers Company going into war, then, you know, they'd they'd have been in better shape. Yeah. Uh, They, uh, in North Africa again in December 1940 at uh, a place called Bak Bak. Uh, I'm going to say how it's pronounced. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, The third Hazars, Royal King Hazars, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Uh, They got bogged down and lost 15 um, Mark Sixes, two versus the Italians in about 10 minutes. So... Mm. They could not have. They didn't always have, have a good day. No, when weird. the defenders are on their game, this is a very dangerous vehicle to be in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they were good at flanking marches. All right, mm. so um, um, oh, they also tried to send a bunch of Mark Sixes to Norway, but they got lost at sea when the Germans sank uh, the transport ship. Mm. So, um, other uses for them was in Malaya and. Indonesia, or Dutch East Indies versus the Japanese, but even then they, they could not stand up against... Well, it wasn't so much the Hargos in, because there wasn't a whole lot of tank-on-tank battles. This would have been a happy time for a Hargo against something like this. They'd be yeah. like, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah we're, the, we're the new breed here. Yeah. Um, you know, and then they the Hargos have to face things like Shermans and Matildas later and it goes very badly. But, but yeah. I, I, there wasn't a lot of uh, documentation of the, the two tanks actually meeting. You'd, you'd assume that the, um, the Mark Sixes were probably just... Um, Interacting with Japanese artillery and knee mortars would do these quite well. well. Just yeah. just infantry uh, without proper infantry support. Mm. Uh, if your if your infantry runs away because they've been uh, subjected to a Japanese advance mm. and uh, you're not reversing fast enough, then uh, you get surrounded. You're probably going to surrender pretty quick. Mm. Um, they were deployed uh, prior to World War Two uh, for a lot of uh, as I was saying before about pl- colonial policing actions, especially in India. Uh, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't have wanted that job, because uh, driving. A bit hot. To, well, mm. I'm just thinking about the, the humanitarian aspects of it too. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, no, it's, it's a grim idea that you know desperate people trying to fight for their freedom, um, you know, get oppressed by um, some barely serviceable, um, otherwise piece of junk that's just beyond their capability to fight. Um, it's not, you know, thrilling. <laughs> um. From North Africa, the Brits sent them to Greece and Crete and then Malta mm. as they retreated out of each of those areas. Didn't retreat from Malta. They didn't retreat from Malta. No, mm. so as I'm saying, that's why it was the last one I said. Oh, ah, right. Right. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. But um, um, uh, uh, August 41, there is. I finally found it, the Australian. The Anglo-Soviet invasion of Iran. In there August, we go. August 41, not uh, 1941. Um, what else we want to say about most numerous. No, I've done that. Look, these tanks were not for serious conflict, but they were for they were what it was. Uh, the governments were willing to pay for at the time, and because they had um, low cost, 
uh, easy, easy to produce, um, not a lot of uh, requ uh, manufacturing requirements. It's thin steel, uh, a small engine, 88 horsepowers for uh, both um, the Mark Four, the Mark Sixes, and the Six Tons. Uh, mm. That got upgraded by various countries as they got hold of them. Um, they were useful vehicles and incredibly useful as training vehicles for start for building tank cadres and all the logistical support. We, we mentioned that earlier about the six ton. Similarly with the light, it oh, yeah, served that so role, the, and and it even, was even the Nazis used them for uh, training purposes and mm -hmm. converted more of them into self propelled guns after the ones they captured from the Dunkirk, uh, Dunkirk, yeah. Dunkirk, and uh, and other mm -hmm. places and yeah. Crete. Cre Having said that, you know, if you were saying, what is the vehicle we want to fight World War II, this wouldn't be your choice. But, some, you know, it's not that dissimilar in capability from, say, the American M2. Um, and, uh, you know, the, I mean, this is kind of why the, the um, M3 Grant Lee was um, viewed as awesome, even though it was such an objectively <laughs> terrible tank, was because it was an upgrade from this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, in its time, in its moment, in 1936, it was quite a nifty design, and it um, and then was still the only thing available later when things got a bit grim. Um, anyway, we've got a few more things to talk about. Um, mm -hmm. We're going to play a video now that we shot up at um, Oz Armor Fest. Um, Which inspired these. Yes. Um, Got mine here. There we go. Uh, <laughs> yes, um, and um, so Lottie, uh, thank you for the tip with the. Um, so L Lottie, Lottie, the tank whisperer, um, is um, quite a character, and there aren't many women in tank world. Uh, and um, she Who can drive. Well, there aren't shoes. many women. Full stop. <laughs> Fix break. Yeah, yeah. Um, she, she, uh, she's, she's quite the. Um, she's a very important figure at the uh, Australian Museum of Armour and Artillery, and um, um, we really appreciate the touch. Yeah, and also a really um, fantastic human being. And um, yes, so um, here's Lottie, and then we'll be back um, at the end of that to talk about tank biathlon. Recent events in Ukraine. Uh, Tasman tells us the Kerch Bridge is on fire. Um, nice. Yes, but there's there's lots of other things happening in Ukraine. Um, obviously, that we we'll talk about uh, and the uh, new Abrams X. So that's all coming up um, after the uh, break. Folks, so it's Lottie Hasseldine, uh, Hassel, Hassel Grant. Hassel Grant, sorry, I've forgotten the like, two minutes you've told me. That's right. <laughs> and she's one of the uh, well, wonderful tank maintainers and drivers and everything person here at the uh, Cairns uh, Armour and Artillery Museum. And uh, look, we've had such a wonderful weekend here, and we really appreciate the uh, time and effort you've uh, taken to speak with us, spend uh, and the work you've done with the tanks and driving us around in the uh, Sabre. That was great fun. We bounced around all over the place and really felt the difference in the uh, short wheelbase tracks versus the uh, Leopards and the uh, T-72. So look, could you tell us something about, about what you do here besides everything? <laughs> everything is a good word for it. Um, generally, I'm one of the uh, apprentice mechanics here, so I look after pretty well everything that you see out there. If it runs, it's got an engine in it. I've done work on it. I'm also one of the firearms instructors here. I look after all the firearms, teach people how to shoot. Um, that's the general coverage of what I do. Yeah. All right, and uh, look, we've seen you uh, Guiding, driving, uh, maintaining, braking vehicles uh, over the last two days, and uh, we really appreciated uh, seeing you out there and doing all the work you've done. I've got to say, the first thing I noticed when I saw you out there was uh, the goggles, and that was, that was one of the things I thought to myself, oh, I hope they sell those in the gift shop because, but no, they don't, so uh, we're all going to go online and try and find your uh, yeah. eBay, uh, eBay, eBay, eBay uh, <laughs> split prism uh, uh, tank goggles. Um, look, I bet this. Uh, I know this is a huge weekend for the uh, museum, and you would have done hundreds of hours of work trying to get everything ready. <laughs> Good, hundreds of hours of work getting it up, uh, up and running. Uh, how has it been for you for this uh, last couple of days? Oh, uh, it's been like a normal Oz Armour Fest. A lot of stress, a lot of anxiety in the lead up beforehand. You get breakdowns, you get all of that sort of jazz. Um, but it's been good. Yeah. Overall, positive. Everyone's happy. Everyone's 
really having a great time, which is the important thing. That is, it is. I think everybody has had a great time, even uh, even with a bit of rain today. Everybody's uh, enjoying seeing the tanks yeah. go around the mud. It's a bit of a different thing to a bit, uh, bit of a washout compared to the last two days, <laughs> but hey, it's a bit of difference. It is a bit of a difference. Look, uh, and we understand that uh, you're going to be uh, doing some of your own stuff on YouTube soon. Is that true? Do you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. Um, so I'm starting my channel. Technically, it's already out there. I've only got one video, but. You can have a look at it if you like leopards or whatever. Um, it's Lottie the Tank Whisperer. Lottie the Tank, that's a good name. Lottie, yep. I like that one. Um, so yeah, I'm currently in the works of trying to get a few videos up, starting with a in-depth look at Centurion. So not just history and whatnot, actually getting into it, showing you the engine, um, how it all goes together, the important bits. So yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to uh, share with the world about uh, the Kansas Museum or uh, your own role in it? Or? Um, come on down. So we're in Cairns, far north Queensland. Um, lovely staff here. We all have a great time. Um, and every year we're running Ozama Fest. Every year. Every year. So put it in your calendars for next year. Will do. Thank you very much, Lottie. I really appreciate the time you've taken for us today. Not a problem. Bye. And welcome back, folks. Um, you can see we always inspired our... Uh, Split prism goggles. Mm -hmm. Look, look at, look how cool I look now. Hey, yeah. <laughs> now, just to uh, just to point out that um, I think Pete and Lottie, who were sporting those goggles at the Australian Armour and Artillery Museum, didn't actually wear them for any sort of tank activities and wore normal uh, safety goggles uh, and just had those ones sitting on their hats like I was having before. So I think they're mostly there to keep the dust off if you are wearing them I over the eyes. I think but, they're yeah. mainly for show. Just mm. like ours are, mm. they are cosmetic slash uh, costume mm. style uh, things and I would not want to wear them on a motorbike uh, while riding around at stupid speeds or anything like that. Yeah, well, now, mean, split prism does give you some advantages in terms of... Um, I don't think uh, the plastic in the lenses mm. is, is all that safe. Yeah. However, <laughs> what we've come back with is mm -hmm. another... Second beer review. Mm -hmm. um, yes, because we did a second tank, we apparently. We did two tanks, so yeah. I thought, why not? Um, okay, so this is the Green King of Berry St. Edmunds IPA. So another British mm. IPA. It is crisp and refreshing and 500 millilitres, but only 3.6 alcohol, which is kind of perfect to round out the podcast. Mm -hmm. sound, sound Beautiful good. head on this and lovely colour. Look at that. It's a green beer. Oops. Green can. Yeah. Green, green um, spot with an E on the end, by the way. Green king. Yes. But they did actually make the cans green. Mm. Hmm. Mm. Mm. That's a very different flavour profile. Seventeen ninety nine and much easier to read actually. Got to mm -hmm. say on the yeah, my so, poor, poor old eyes. Our signature IPA delivers the same refreshing hoppy taste today as our founders Green King created all those years ago. Um, Seventeen ninety nine, the brewery was founded. Um, Green and King mm, doesn't. I mean, this is a much more British style IPA. Um, Barry St Edmunds. Mm -hmm. uh, who knows? I don't know. Sorry, no, if anybody not. does, uh, any of our English viewers do know where that is, please let us know, because, yeah, but no. Okay, um, so just update from Tasman on the Kerch Bridge, which we'll get to in the Ukraine. Uh, hit by a missile, apparently. Oil tankers Ooh. are on fire. Um, the wow. bridge-carrying trains have fallen into the ocean. This is sounding very exciting. Is thank, it? thank you for the updates. Is the Kerch Bridge is the big one that joins Crimea back to Russia. Yeah, they cross the uh, CMM of... Um, See as of as of yeah yes um, yes yeah cool okay any other thoughts on this beer other than yeah yeah oh you haven't even tasted it yet okay I have, but... much more British style IPA so it's more um, spicy than um, fruity yeah no I, I agree mm. yeah I was about to say I didn't have to really have the words for how different it was but uh, mm -hmm. no, that is a good description of it yeah um. I like it actually. I'm not sure. It's um, mm -hmm. from between the two. I think the other one was much heavier t on taste, yeah. uh, but more to my palate. Whereas this is uh, lighter on taste, but a uh, very distinct taste that I'm not mm. sure actually uh, is is my favourite. Look, I um, not. It doesn't mean mm. I'm not going to drink it. It, it, it just means 
I may not <laughs> buy it again. <laughs> yeah. In my own brewing, I actually try and get a, a, a straddle line between the, the, the fruity hot flavours and the um, the more earthy, spicy um, British ones. Mm. Um, and um, this is very much moving the needle way over in that earthy, spicy mm. um category but right. um so four pack of these from plonk uh, mm-hmm. was 18 dollars. so there you go four pack so it's like four bucks 50 a can no oh, hang on uh maybe it was 28 dollars. ah okay a bit yeah, different no, it, mm. no hang no it was it was mm. no it was uh it was 18 okay that's yeah. good. well that's well i mean it's quite low alcohol which uh, at least so there's not much exercise on it um, true yep yeah no it was 18 dollars. Mm. so because yeah. the other two were yes Look, as a session beer, you could knock that back. Um, no, maybe it was twenty dollars, but anyway, it was yeah, probably it okay. was much cheaper than. You could you could definitely knock it back for a while, so mm. that's good. Um, cool. Okay, let's now talk about um, Ukraine. Yes. Mm-hmm. On the way to Svatava. Yes. Cool. So there we go. Um, so the the. We've shared it on our social media, so if you have, don't already follow Totally Tanked, um, Facebook, Twitter, um, there was a, um, this engagement that's um, up on the screen was actually a Russian tank from there, the 155th Naval um, Infantry Brigade, which was also the unit that took Mariupol, so they seem to have their act together as opposed mm-hmm. to every other Russian unit in this conflict. I've been very disappointed by the Guards Tank Army, so I can tell you. <laughs> um... Well, I'm glad they haven't done well, but because I don't want Ukraine to be destroyed. But I, you know, just thought they were a better unit than they turned out to be. Um, anyway, so yes, um, it, you, you almost never see tanks fighting tanks at 50 meter range, and it's a really interesting engagement because they're playing a little forward and backward dance to try and get and, their guns and, and onto that each really other. Really shows the uh, the difference in the engines where the, you have one tank that can do 4Ks an hour backwards, and the other one can do 15. Yeah, when you're when you're in that little forward backward dance, having the slow reverse gear really starts and to bite. And that's um, Sarah, um, so uh, it's a Russian T eighty versus a Ukrainian T sixty four. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, the T sixty four came out very much second best in that one. Uh, we do have to remember with these things that real people are dying um, in these things. So and we're just grateful um, it's not us, and yeah. we hope it's not going to be them anytime soon either. Yeah, um, my mum. My mum likes to uh, find little bits of uh, newspaper paper oh, articles and, okay. about tanks and cut them out for me. Okay. So just before we went up to uh, Cairns, uh, she cut one out about uh, Mephisto and uh, how it's uh, photographs of Mephisto from 1918 uh, and passed that one on to me. And I got to share that one with the chieftain uh, while we were sitting around the pub one night. He was very polite with your little scarecrow I know, newspaper. I know. Yeah. Just, <laughs> so mum's cut it out, another one for me to talk mm. about uh, the T-90M uh, that was captured in Ukraine and um, by, by the Ukrainians. Uh, so this is the, the most advanced Russian tank, tank. In, unless you count the Armada, which is an Armada tank. Yep. Um, yes. And, and how everybody's going to start looking at this and saying, oh, what's it got inside of it? Mm. I mean, the, the big thing with the T-90 series is it's a T-72 upgraded with Western technology, um, which is a problem for the Russians because they don't have access to that technology now. Um, but uh, maybe they'll find something that the Chinese can make them that'll, that'll work. <laughs> um, yeah, it was embarrassing for them to, to lose the T-90M um, in well, Ukraine. Well, have one captured. Yeah. Uh, whereas previous ones that have been disabled, they've mm. uh, taken out and blown up themselves mm. in order to prevent that intelligence falling into Western hands. But uh, this one, yeah, has come out and... Uh, we are, as we did the last episode, it was literally while the first breakout was happening around Kharkov and since the Ukrainians have been making uh, very successful advances. Mm. A few people who are quite clever have made the point, and I like it, um, it comes back to um, Clausewitz's um, thoughts on the culmination of assaults. Um, and that when you uh, your assault is culminating, which means you, you've reached the point where you can't go forward anymore, you're incredibly vulnerable to any counterattack, even even a yes, weak you're counterattack. You're you're completely overstretched. Your units are depleted. Um, your troops are fatigued, um, and um, this this one doesn't quite fall into that because the Ukrainians have sort of been you know spent quite a few months in um, in a stalemate with the Russians before they counterattacked. Well, they, um, they did a great job of uh, some uh, sowing uh, false intelligence. Of saying we're going to attack here, so on, we're going to attack here, so on. Mm. Drew 
twenty five thousand uh, Russian troops from the from the Kharkiv area to mm-hmm. uh, to Kherson, and yep. then uh, have gone through, uh, through around the Kharkiv area in uh, five days, and, and are still going forward into uh, uh, into that uh, northern Luhansk area, uh, while at the same time putting some. Uh, Ma- Kherson it- is still in a really ugly pocket for the Russians. They're oh, yeah. either going to lose the city or they're going to lose an army there. Yeah, but, but the uh, point is that they, they uh, by having uh, by telegraphing their punch to Kherson, mm. they're able to sucker them in uh, in Kharkiv. Yeah. Uh, whereas the the Russians are still trying to um, the the Wagner group, the the mercenaries of the Wagner group are still trying to uh, bust through in the the Donbass area to absolutely no avail whatsoever. But um, yeah, I mean it's it's worth. Really worth paying attention to what's happening in Russia at the moment. Um, the there have been an enormous number of Russian billionaires die this year. Oh yeah, um, <laughs> under I, under under mysterious accidents. Yeah, falling out of hospital window, yes. um, falling that, downstairs. Yeah, uh, and what we might well be I think, seeing. I think it was it sixteen? It was twelve last time I looked, but there's All been right. a few more since. Yeah. Um, so. And that's a lot because these are people with access to extremely good health care. And, um, and lots and lots and lots of... These are billionaires, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and what we might actually be seeing is the start of a Russian civil war, um, which is quite a horrendous thought in, mm. uh, in, in, in the modern era, uh, particularly with disruptions to energy supplies and the effects that's going to have on um, the rest of the world. Well, well these, uh, these billionaires are all being part of the oil and gas uh, organisation. Well, that's, that's where Russian billionaires uh, yeah. come from, generally. Yeah, that's um, uh, basically they're the ones who all... Uh, so who knows what's happening. And the other thing that we haven't uh, talked about since the last podcast is uh, Putin has also called up the partial mobilisation of the Russian population. So Yep. Now, now, something that's been almost unreported in Western media is that um, from the time he made his first um, special military operation in Ukraine... Uh, it's been six months. Yep. And fifty thousand Russian regulars contract papers came up, and not one of them wanted to sign on <laughs> for for to re up. Um, so they're pulling up uh, at least you know your twenty two to thirty year olds who've done their military service that are getting dragged back in are probably going to be quite useful soldiers. It's not like um, the last days of the Third Reich when they were calling up um, children and very old men. Um, Grandfathers, yeah. Yeah, but at the same time, um, to be losing uh, 50,000 fighting soldiers at this moment of a losing war, um, because none of them want to... uh, Well, I'm not saying none. I'm sure one or two... uh, They probably won't get an option to re-up. Well, no, apparently they... they, um, Apparently 50,000 are walking off the job. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> they, so. they probably won't get the option of walking off the job, is my point, is that they'll bring in new laws yeah. and say, yes, no, you must do, continue and, your service. And uh, also, as has been gleefully noted by Western media, there's traffic jams of young Russians fleeing the country uh, to yes. uh, to get Georgia. away from the mobilisation. Yeah. And, and it was uh, Putin's uh, 60th birthday. Uh, 60th? Happy 70th. birthday, what? 60th or 70th? Is it, uh, must be 70th. It, uh, really? Yeah, it must be 70. It doesn't look like a 70-year-old. It looks more like a 60-year-old, but he's been led a very active life. I feel as I approach 50, I really haven't you know, done <laughs> what, much. Haven't <laughs> overthrown <laughs> democracies, killed enough people, yeah. uh, exploited uh, your, you know, you, the, the work of your country enough that to make you... Written my old. name in letters of fire a mile high. Well, that's yeah. what we're doing here, um, John. We, yeah. are, we are providing a something that the future generations can look yeah. back on and say... What were these idiots doing? Yeah, there's, there's, there's seven people watching us right now. Uh, <laughs> many more people do um, see and listen to well, us. Well, so I'm, just, I'm looking uh, at Dave Lister as my inspiration. As oh, you want to get abducted onto a mining ship? And, he wasn't uh, abducted. Yeah. But anyway, he has his... He, he doesn't he, know. He was so drunk, he can't remember. He yeah. is, his name was, spans across the millennia. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> big takeaways in, in Russia, though. Uh, I mean... So you, you interrupted me at a, at a moment there. Around Kharkiv, um, mm. the quality of the troops that the Ukrainians assaulted into after they'd dragged every, all their real troops down to, to Kherson um, was, um, we're literally talking um, tax police. Ooh. Okay. Uh, and, and, you know, that, that, that sort of level of gendarmerie, um, par- paramilitary mm. units um, that, um, that ended up copying the, uh, the main assault because the Russians had gotten psyched out. And given that the Russians have this horrible split command um, where they've got um, independent generals in the... Um, yeah, there's no coordination. No in in the Kharkiv region and the, oh, um, the Kherson and, and region. And that was the whole point of uh, the operational security of not having one person in command. 
Uh, well, um, <laughs> how's that going for them? Anyway, the, the the dude in the south somehow managed to convince the dude in the north to give him um, a, a ton of troops, and um, that has not gone very well at all, which will not foster better cooperation in the future. One of the things in the map we've got on the background, though, is that apparently there's a large insurgency um, kicking off in the um, area between Mariupol and um, Kherson, um, which is a further problem for the Russians, and... Given that the Russians started this stupid war for no good reason, stuff them, let them have problems. I want to talk about Elon Musk now, though. Yeah, yeah. Now, okay. now uh, I would say that Elon's proposal on Twitter this week um, was, was... He was high? Uh, well, I would say it was something he, that... Let's face it, he was high. Yeah, but four months ago... It depends, was, depends what on. But yeah, but four months ago, what he was proposing this week was what I was proposing four mm. months ago. So it's like, yes, four months ago, this was um, a sensible um, settlement for Ukraine to make to get make this whole nightmare end. But having mortgaged their future um, to um, fight this war and having succeeded in uh, breaking the Russian lines and let's see how far they can go before the Russians can stabilise things, now is not the time to tell the Ukrainians they have to be moderate and reasonable. Yeah, no. Um, you as, 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 Maybe you should tell that to the Russians <laughs> in 2014, maybe not. Yeah, uh, so the, um, you know, as long as the Ukrainians don't start eating into Russian territory, and frankly, even if, you know... Well, sorry, w- with the sham uh, um, referendum that was held um, within the four uh, supposed four areas of Ukraine that, yeah. that uh, Vlad has now annexed and said these are now these people have chosen to be Russian nobody believes that Vlad no is the point um it does create a problem, and this was why Vladimir went through this sham, which is under the Russian constitution, no one can cede Russian territory ever mm. so having legalistically in the Russian system um, redrawn the boundaries of Russia through the middle of Ukraine for territory they're not even in control of at this moment no. um and with a they, they then um, make it's impossible for um, any future Russian leader or even for Vladimir to give that away without going through the trouble of a constitutional amendment. And I can't see the Russian people particularly signing up enthusiastically to mm. um, give away territory any which way. That would be a very hard political sell. Um, one of the things we are seeing in Russia itself, though, is um, the people... From the anecdotes I'm getting from Western media reporting on it, is the people still aren't actually against the idea of the special operation. It's just that they don't want to get drafted, and that's why they're pushing back against the the government. Is they don't want to get drafted. It's not so much that they don't want to go to. They don't want um, uh, Ukraine to be uh, uh, taken over by Russia. Now, your thoughts on that? It, it, reading Russian public opinion for Westerners is really hard, right. um, and we. Really, I agree. That's why I don't yeah. think I don't. I don't take that at face value. But yeah, we, we, we're really bad at it, and I mean, there's been you know just things like um, you know Western punk bands going to play gigs in Russia and being like, yeah, solidarity with Pussy Riot, and getting um, booed off the stage, <laughs> and um, you know the uh, beer bottles thrown at them till they have to flee the stage. Um, you know, Russians have um, quite a unique. Um, perspective I was going to say weird but it's not weird it's entirely no. sensible for them there is a Adam Curtis um, documentary coming out in just the next few weeks about how the West um, destroyed the Russian economy and through it killed millions of Russians um, in the 1990s and it's something we're completely ignorant of we're like yay why do the Russians hate us so much and it's <laughs> like no we, we literally murdered th- at least three million Russians in the 1990s um, Without the bombs, but uh, it probably happened. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it didn't need bombs. It was done with finance. Yeah. Um, it which doesn't, way, doesn't make which, you which, fit. Is, which is the way the West is killing themselves then as well. Well, yeah, that's uh, we've got a bunch of problems there. Um, Liz Truss is going to find out about that. Well, Liz Truss has come. already learned a lot about that. Yeah, <laughs> in the last two weeks of yeah. uh, saying yes, they're going to. Uh, uh, tax, tax uh, sorry, cut, provide tax cuts to the rich and then pay for it by uh, taking out loans from the bank. Mm. Uh, and also, you know, uh, cutting services to poor people. Oh, yeah, um, no, poor people don't count. Yeah. They don't. So yeah, they, uh, it's, they're going to let them starve and freeze over winter. Look, the UK events are really important because the geopolitics, the UK has been bankrolling uh, the Ukrainian war um, in a very significant way and the uh, continued existence of the UK for the next six months is 
and look what happened here. Uh, <laughs> and, and look, the, the Russian oligarchs who own uh, most, of, most central, of London, yeah. most of central London, uh, are really going to start being upset. Well, so basically, Vlad will get ups, upset on their behalf of if his property values go down, which is why they have to keep on providing uh, tax cuts to the uh, ultra rich and mm. the bank CEOs. I think I think they've actually oh, singled, they, they, singled, they, they got rid singled, of the caps on bonuses. Yeah, yeah. They, got, they, they singled out the bank CEOs to not get uh, to not be able to uh, be be able to make their billions of. Uh, mm dollars and so forth so yeah um anyway it's all complicated and on that we're going to move i think from now on to the tank biathlon yeah which um it's we're a little late on this because we just had a really busy schedule for last um month and um but while we were up at um ozama fest we watched the um the, the the final round it is it's, it's a shame the world can't come together a little more so we see some Western tanks competing. So in, for in those the tank who don't biathlon. know, the tank biathlon is run by the Russians. Yeah. Uh, and for any countries that would like to partake, and they get to run around in T-72s and do various activities. It doesn't have to be T-72s. It's just most of the countries are poor countries that can't afford to send... Well, they literally can't afford to send tanks, so they send a crew that uses the Russian T-72. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the idea is that you're running around in the T-72. The Chinese do provide their own, but mm-hmm. uh, it has to be of a tank equivalent to a T-72. And they drive around a track... Uh, they w- swerve and weave. They go through uh, uh, ditches. They go through water fort- obstacles. Water obstacles. Mm-hmm. They fire off the main gun. They mm-hmm. fire off the um, um, the external gun. Uh, sorry, the crew operated gun. Mm. Uh, and they score points and do other activities. That looks mm. look. I tell you what, it looks like a huge amount of fun. Mm. Um, but it's a lot of national pride because there are how many countries? About twenty countries in all twenty countries compete. But I mean, you know, things like the Ethiopian team and the Iranian team. You know, they were just smashing into things and leaving the track. And, uh, and, and, you know, Venezuelans. And, uh, Venezuelans were not great. Well, they were fantastic to watch, but they, they did not perform well. Um, and, you know, it, it, you just watch a lot of idiot cousins and nephews of ruling oligarchs who haven't bothered to do the training that would have been sensible to do before leaving the country. Uh, so I, it's, bet, I bet Harry would have uh, been able to drive those tanks better. I don't know. I mean, yeah, he's, he's got he's got uh, experience. He's a competent bloke. Uh, I, was, I was more just thinking he doesn't have a lot of heavy armor experience, but he, yeah, he no, would have he would have done the training. So well, no, he, he drove light he drove light ones, but mm-hmm. uh, not not uh, heavy tanks. But uh, mm. he'd have a bit of use and command. So anyway, they drive around. So teams of four uh, tanks go around this track and carry out various uh, challenges. And in the final, there was the Belarusians, the Uzbeks. The Chinese and the Russians, and mm. do we think the uh, somebody nobbled the Chinese there, John? Because they were driving the Type Nine. I want to say it was, it was a Type Ninety. Yeah, type 90. The, the the Chinese did well. Uh, they finished second, but, um, but they did have an unfortunate uh, incident with one of their tanks, whereby they had to swap out one tank for another. Yeah, um, it, it was, a, it was a bit like behind. watching Formula One when you have a bad pit crew change. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That sort of thing. But um, the Chinese did well. It's quite funny watching it with the commentary. And it's a, a Russian person who speaks English. And it's exactly like watching a South African commentator um, when, the, when the Springboks are playing in, in the unbelievably biased... That's a very apt, biased, that's um, a ab- very ab- oh, apt uh, yeah. description. Ho, ho, ho. Superior Russian training means better performance. Ha, ha, ha. Uh, anyway, so it was, it, it was fun to get that in a small dose. Um, but uh, our point... We might, have, we might have been at the... Uh, uh, Tank, uh, sorry, at um, the Armour Fest uh, for most of the day and had a few uh, quiet ales before Ooh. and after um, watch, yeah. watching these, these uh, the tank biathlon. Yeah. Look, if we next time we go to Armour Fest with the biathlon, so we'll have to get a public we can um, convince to put it on. Oh, but, so uh, I reckon we'll be able to do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, cool. Okay, and now as we round this out, we have, it's very exciting, Rob, the Abrams X. Oh, here we go. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Look, look, look at the scroll effect. Hey. <laughs> look at the tanks. And what about what, what does this tank have in common with the uh, the Porsche Tiger One? I think it was. It's a diesel electric. Design. It's a diesel electric. Now I, I did love a, a fight I had on the internet a couple of years ago. Um, someone said, "Oh well, you know, um, electric engines maybe they they aren't ready for prime time," and it's like. United States battleships were built with electric engines in the 1920s. So I, I think electric engines um, are, are a moderately um, 
mature technology. But yes, so it's a um, it's a, a hybrid electric engine they're proposing. This is still a technology demonstrator. It's not a real tank. The Abrams X. Um, I still I did ask the question: When mm. are we going to go? Uh, when they're going to accept the idea? It's no longer an Abrams Abrams M mm. one. It is an Abrams M two or something else. Yeah, I think they got, they, you've got to come. They're going to uh, separate themselves from the idea that this is just a new version of the M1. It is no longer an M1. It is a different tank. But you, you're seeing this in, in the Air Force and the Navy where various planes, uh, particularly the F-15 and the F-18, uh, are in versions now that are fundamentally not the earlier vehicle, particularly the, the Super Hornet and the um, F-15EX. Uh, uh, Wildly different um, mm, from what they were forty years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for, for the the current mood in Congress is that they'll approve upgrades to existing platforms, but they don't want to see a new type. Mm. Um, so new types cost billions, whereas, mm. well, sorry, hundreds of billions rather yeah, trillions than, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, F thirty five. Looking at you. <laughs> um, yeah. Of which we did not get a flyover for the. Uh, Oh, you want to talk about that enormous disappointment? Oh, yeah. Yes, the, the, the worst traditions of the Royal Australian Air Force. So for the, 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 the service of National Memorial for the passing of Queen Elizabeth II, our, Queen our, of our, Australia. Queen of Australia, our ruler. <laughs> um, sovereign, at least. Yeah. But, yeah, um, so for... The, She's the, on all our money. <laughs> the, I, I, I woke up that morning and I, I asked the um, the Google to tell me what was happening. and um, we, had a, we had a day off on that Thursday. Yeah. Um, because you couldn't have it on the Friday because the AFL Grand Final was happening that weekend. Yeah. And so you didn't want to cut into that. So you had no. to have the day of mourning for our uh, sovereign passing had, on the Thursday. It had more to do with the Prime Minister getting back from the service. It had London, more um, to do yeah, with anyway, the okay. AFL Grand Final on the weekend. Let me tell my story. Yeah. You've had a lot of talk in this episode. All right. Um, so... Morning news from the ABC is suddenly saying there will be a six F thirty five fly past at the end of the service at I think it was eleven a.m. and six. You don't normally see a six fly past of anything in this country, um, and F thirty fives is as the absolute newest thing. So um, I, Sheridan actually agreed to go and watch this thing. So we stood on Anzac Parade where they were going to fly down with um, a few thousand other people, um, and. Um, Eleven o'clock rolled around. Nothing happened. And it was just the comments in the in, 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 when you said and and your brother was asking. So what's the bet? How many are going to turn up? Yeah, yeah. Because people were like, oh, the F thirty five. It's a piece of junk. They'll 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 they'll, they'll be missing a few. And and then it was like, um, yeah, none. That was how many the Air Force could fly. And their ex- miserable excuse was that uh, there was a. Large, large storm. There was a torrential downpour event at um, the, the base they were planning to fly them out of. But it's twenty twenty two, and they have access to weather forecasting. If they and this is the classic thing with the Royal Australian Air Force, they are never committed to any mission. They And, and they are most of all committed to themselves and, and doing anything they're not very good at. Sorry, you have to keep quiet now. But uh, <laughs> And so instead of saying, oh, there's a huge storm coming in, we'll need to get those planes to another base to uh, fly down for the... Because it's not like we don't have a um, you know a, an a airfield. Large, a large country with lots of airfields. Or an airfield here in Canberra that they could have taken off from if need be. Um, yeah, no, instead they just cancelled the whole thing, um, you know, which is truly the RAF's fitting, uh, tribute to the monarch. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't be bothered. See you later. Um, okay. Back to the Abrams Well, X. sorry. So the Australian Federation Guard were out in the rain mm. sending up their, uh, 21. No, it was a 96. 96 gun salute. 96 gun salute. Uh, no, salute. The, the day the monarch passed, the, uh, Federation Guard were lugging artillery pieces in also pissing rain. Yep. Um, onto um, the, the four-quarter Parliament House to... Uh, and they did their job. Um, yes. Okay, back to the Abrams X. Um, the big thing is they're talking about eliminating the loader. They're talking about a um, slightly reduced turret size so that they can... Uh, and, and a much reduced weight size. Yeah, but they're... they're they're, they're, so they're following the Russians' queue with Armada and moving all the crew into the body of the tank so it's an automated turret. Um and uh, and it's 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 a hybrid engine and uh, having just taken possession of a hybrid in the last month, um, there are some things you learn when you're driving one, which is you're gonna uh, beep at birds when you come up to them on the road because they don't hear the car coming. Well, it's, it's not that quiet. <laughs> that, that you've got a fully electric vehicle, but things like when you're sitting in the vehicle and you know you've got the manual and you're trying to change the settings to to do what you want to do. Um, when it's depleted the battery um, to a certain point, it just starts the engine to uh, top it up instead yeah. of having to worry about running your battery flat. Mm. 
Um, I, I am wondering how the uh, chieftain will feel about because uh, he has a dislike against electric vehicles, as as he's shown in these t-shirts and as we discussed in the other week. Mm. Um, how do you feel about his beloved uh, Abrams going to a hybrid? Uh, but that'll be interesting what he thinks of it. I, mm. I look forward to seeing what he says. It, it is a technology development. And I, I, I was thinking about it, what's going to be the use of it? Uh, and uh, it really will be in that silent running, essentially, of moving through urban terrain. Uh, where you won't hear a heavy diesel engine uh, or heavy d- diesel turbine coming down the street, uh, and suddenly, <clears throat> whereas that's what you can hear now, if you're in some sort of a, uh, urban activity, uh, you won't hear that coming anymore. And so, whereas now you'll uh, with this future uh, Abrams X, you'll turn around the corner and there will be a possibly 60, 70 ton tank that is rolled up with the bit of clanking of tracks, but without the mm. um, the turbo diesel going and announcing its presence uh, around the city streets or uh, any sort of um, uh, area that you don't have good lines of sight going. It's You get some interesting points of management, but to, to basically just be able to sit and um, be quiet with the, um, the tank still mm. powered up is, is an important thing to be able to do. Uh, you kind of go back to, you know, World War Two tanks could just um, sit and, um, you know, manually uh, traverse the gun with the, with the engine off. Um, and and we've, we've sort of lost that as more and more electrical systems mm. have come on. Um, oh, and, and requiring a, a second power pack, you know, just be able to run at low, low power to be able to do those sort of things, mm. which a lot of tanks have, uh, are incorporated. Auxiliary power units, yeah. yeah. Uh, doing those days. Uh, yeah. The other one is... Um, uh, with the weight reduction that they're looking for, as as I was saying, the 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 Abrams at the moment is a seventy three ton tank, um, and that causes a lot of challenges for on the logistics side of supporting and manoeuvring this vehicle, whether it's across bridges, flying at various places. If they're going to reduce that weight, um, that weight is obviously probably going to come off the um, armor of the vehicle. And they're going to be relying more upon active protections, whether it's um... yeah. But if if you, if, I mean, if you can reduce the volume of the tank, mm. you can reduce the weight of the armor and still give the same level of protection. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of compromises and quid pro quos in there, and and then you got to get some hard planning factors in, like what is the tank shipping weight they want? Because mm. uh, the C17 is out of production, so. What's the next transport plane going to be able to fit in terms of volume um, and also in terms of weight? Um, and I imagine some very smart people are doing a lot of um, spreadsheet work trying mm. to figure that out at the moment. And yeah, well, and if you can decrease the uh, the actual size of it, uh, you'll be able to fit it into whatever container you're trying to um, move it around in, uh, as long but, but uh, well, well as well as the weight. Um, mm. But I do think they're probably going to. It, to my mind, the idea would be you go to less physical armour and more active protection of whatever um, that's more uh, reliable than saying, I hope um, my uh, whatever round is, uh, whatever anti tank uh, round is coming in, whether it's a missile or tank round or um, artillery or uh, aircraft launched is going to be able to protect physically versus I'm going to sh- shoot off something that's going to intercept whatever's coming in so it blows up 30 metres away from me rather than on the side of my hull. Uh, and that would be a way to save a lot of uh, armour weight in that regard and saying, okay, what's the minimum we can take if if I can take out 80% of the, re- 80% of the uh, uh, anti-tank uh, ordnance coming in at my vehicle and 30 metres away rather than on my, uh, on my hull. I mean, everyone wants onions of protection, mm. you know, and, and multiple re- rings of it. Uh, but you do have a point that it's going to be reached, though, with active protection mm. where um, electronic warfare is going to become as important as it is in aerial warfare, um, you know, because um, if you can turn off the um, enemy's um, active protection system um, with a um, carefully timed radar burst, um, then they're, you know, suddenly they're a sitting duck. Um, 
there's a lot of people going to have to make a lot of decisions. They're not all going to get it right. No. Um, they're probably going to be better informed than we are, though. So, you know, you've got to give them that. Um, I'd like to think so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to think that the people making these decisions are... Uh, He's hoping. Yeah, um, are uh, yeah. better equipped than we are. So sometimes a lot of this stuff is just dumb luck. The difference between a great general and a general despised by history is often just, you know, the great general got really lucky. Um it's it, it, it generals who win lots of battles. You got to say there's a bit more going on well, than one stroke of luck. <laughs> as Napoleon says, I don't need a competent generals or, uh, or one whatever. lucky ones. One yeah. Lucky ones. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. I think we're at the end here. Uh, Tasman has pointed out the French Nexta EMBT design um, has. Um, also come out this week. We haven't had time to have a look at that. Um, it's interesting with the German French that, you know, basically the, the combined design is going so slowly that everyone else is starting to say, Hey, use our design. Not right um, now saying, Hey, here's one I've already prepared. Yeah. Yeah. Well, next has basically done that from the French side now. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, I um, bet they, uh, they whipped that up in the last, uh, two months after, uh, Ryan metal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, hard to say on that front. Um, but on that note, uh, so do please give us reviews on whatever service you're listening to. Um, seven, seven stars. Yeah, as many stars as you can do and, and some kind words are good. Um, and, um, join us on Patreon, um, or, um, buy a t-shirt, um, on our Facebook and Twitter now have pinned, um, posts saying where to find all these things. With our Patreon folks, we mm. are looking to do, uh, some sort of catch up once a quarter. And uh, yes, we only have one uh, top tier uh, stamps. It'll just be us and stamps, uh, unless more people sign up look, for the dude. I'm looking, for the top I'm looking tier. forward to catching up and mm. uh, at a suitable time for all of us and yeah. having a brew and talking mm. tanks because guys, we're happy to talk this stuff out. And yeah. uh, and look, as we said uh, before, we took the um, the invite to go over the British interwar tanks, and we'll probably uh, review other people's suggestions as to what tanks we should do at mm-hmm. uh, later dates. I do think we, we need to do a reasonably modern tank next one. Oh, but, we'll, yeah. we'll take we'll take mm. suggestions and mm. then we'll make a choice from based upon that as to where mm. we go next. But uh, stay tuned. I'm sure we'll have something that somebody will like to talk about. And you're right. The um, the modelling challenge will come up in. Uh, yeah. New, let's say the new January. January yeah. we'll talk the modelling challenge. In fact, that's yeah. going to be a good one for me and the daughter to uh, yeah. work on over school holidays. Oh. Mm. Mm. Okay. 